Another blood red sunset and yet another moon face and still another hundred miles to my next resting place Driving down the road eyes on the horizon within my car I'm all alone but feeling good and feeling strong knowing that this path I'm on brings me to myself I'm driving Hey now all, this is the Spirit Doctor, Kelly Sparta, and you are listening to Spirit Sherpa, the show that helps and encourages you on your journey to unlock your magic mojo. Joey C. is still on vacation, but with me this week is the phenomenal Charlemagne Tremont. And today we're going to be talking about the father of modern magic, Alistair Crowley, or Crowley, depending on who you talk to. Everybody refers to him as Crowley. So we'll probably just call him Crowley, but he thought it was Crowley rhymes with Holy as, as Charlemagne has told me many times in our time together. So welcome Charlemagne. Thank you. Wonderful to be here with you. (laughs) All right. We're going to get, we're going to get hot and heavy on this one because Crowley was, Crowley was quite the character. Yeah. And you know, (laughs) and his, and controversial. Which on purpose. Oh yeah, absolutely. Intentionally. Yeah, um, he, and I like to I joke about this, but in many ways, I think of him, he's sort of my wily coyote, super genius of the magical world. And um, when he was really coming up in the magical world in the Victorian era, especially so. So just a little background for those who do not know, Alistair Crowley was born in 18. 18- 75, October the 12th, as they would say it in England, uh, where he was born. It's his birthday. Mm -hmm. So we're recording this in a very, very well timed. Um, He was remarkable uh, on many levels. Um, I still believe very strongly that a lot of what we have for modern magic, we would not have had we not had Crowley. Um, he was a ceremonialist and a entrepreneur, if you would, of his era in terms of really putting together systems and writing some of the most important books on magic still. And to this day, uh, even though you don't have a video, I'm going to hold it up. One of the most important books that I think every magician should own, every magic practitioner, Crowley 777, one of the most important books you can own for real. Um, it is a book of correspondences. It is one of the most um, thorough that crosses the most number of traditions around the world so that you can really look up any number of things that have correspondences. So for your colors for rituals, for your scents, for your um, numbers, for your astrology, for your various gods and goddesses, almost anything you can imagine for your magical tools. For timing, it's all in that book. It is one of the most comprehensive magical volumes you could ever own. You know, what I think about with him is uh, he reminds me of the Discordians. And so uh, for those of you who don't know, which is probably all of you, the Discordians are a group of um, magical people. They're pagan people who like to do everything disruptive. They are the disruptors. They are the Hayoka. We did an episode on the Hayoka, right? Uh, they are the Hayoka of the of the pagan communities. And they do everything disruptive because, you know, it's good to question everything. And, you know, it would be uh he he would if he were in the shamanic world, he would be known as a coyote. coyote. Shaman. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of what he was doing was trying to disrupt the structures of the day, right? Well, you know, what's interesting about him is you can see it that way. And that's on the on a certain level, that's entirely true. On the other hand, part of what's important to understand about him that's often misunderstood about him is that he really did have a humanitarian vision at the onset. He really thought that he was trying to guide through the principles of magic humanity into the aeon, what he called the aeon of Horus in the 20th century. And it was really about wisdom and really about the ideal man, the evolved man, and really trying to get there the quickest way possible. And that was part of, you know, he used a lot of intense uh, (laughs) methods, should we say. Mm -hmm. He was deeply involved. a lot of sex magic. Well, yeah. Yeah. Lots of sex magic, lots of um, 
moving things in a ceremonial way that were, he was bored. He was part of a, a very important occult order, which maybe we could do another time called the golden dawn that many very well-known magicians were involved with in the Victorian era and beyond. And he was a young upstart in that order. Can't imagine what that's like. Uh, he was a young upstart in that order and um, really pushed the boundaries to the point where he finally left um, some would say in disgrace, others would say in glory, to start his own working groups and did this all over, he traveled all over the world. He was also an expert in yoga and other systems, Eastern systems. He studied them tremendously. He was also a mountaineer. He was a fascinating human being. He climbed mountains as part of his work on himself, as part of his dedication to pushing his own boundaries, right? Um, he also came up with some of the still well-known phrases that we have in magics. The, one of the most famous is, um, do it that will, you know, is the whole of, is many people get that confused, but he, what he really did say, do it that will is the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. And, you know, it's a lot of people have taken that to be just do what you want, but that's not what he means. He is not just advocating for that, although by his behaviors and his thumbing his nose in many regards to many people, many structures, including governmental ones and propriety of society, you could certainly see him that way. Um, but, you know, that was not that was not all that he was about. He also, to my mind, created one of the most important to me, really useful tarot decks ever created. Um, and they were done in paintings that are still in the British Museum that can still be seen. I have seen them. Um, they are so full of energy. He and Lady Frida Harris did this project. It took them, it took a long time and it was grueling. He was an intense artist himself and a, a bit of a taskmaster. But they created what to me, and I will also hold this up. I recently got a new one. I, uh, and I'm going to unbox it on his birthday. This to me is the most important deck. You're it referencing the Crowley deck, the Thoth deck. That, the Thoth deck. Yes, yeah. which is I just remarkable. wanted to make sure you said it out loud. Yes. Because, yeah. Absolutely. It was the second deck I ever got. That's mm -hmm. uh, the first deck I ever bought for myself. Yeah. So, yeah. In incredible deck. Um, it yeah. has got astrological symbology. It's, it's full of color and meaning and symbol. And you could spend, really, you could spend an entire lifetime unpacking that deck it is so rich and it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper and i really feel that he channeled something so powerful when he and Lita frida harris created it so um important to understanding him is also that he spent some time in as a young man in university very frustrated he had a mystical experience he describes it in his writing as a mystical experience while he was in switzerland that opened him up to make him decide he was going to quit college and dedicate himself to magic and the occult he got involved in the golden dawn in the late 1800s um Forgive me, I'm trying to remember the date. I don't remember. But anyway, many very well-known magicians were involved in it. And um, he stayed in that group for quite a while until he became really frustrated. Um, and then he began traveling the world. I just, I just want to say, becoming very frustrated with your group mm -hmm. in magic <laughs> <Can't imagine. laughs> is really not that unusual. <laughs> no, not at all. And again, it especially really as a young I mean, man. Yeah, just to put it in context, I mean, you know, I mean, somebody who, you know, and I just want to, it's one thing to talk about his life, but I want to put it in context of ma modern day magic mm -hmm. practices and, and the fact that a lot of people, when they step onto their spiritual path, often want to just dump their, their, uh, you know, mundane world. Yeah. And, you know, unless you're going to go off and live in a Buddhist monastery, that is not exactly, you know, you know, or any monastery, unless you're going to go live on a kibbutz or, you know, someplace where they're going to take care of you, you know, dumping your life is not generally your best choice. And so uh, I say this right now as we're in an, in a critical astrological transit. And so, you know, this is me saying, 
don't quit your jobs, boys and girls. Right. You know, you're going to need that money to support yourself and it will be useful. Trust me. It's so much easier to be spiritually evolved when you, when you have funds to pay for your life than when you're in survival mode, trying to figure out how to, how to get your next meal or where you're going to put your head down. So, but you know, this is pretty common in, in magical, in, in, when you're on a hardcore spiritual path, you know, the, the desire to dump your outside life, the desire to find community and then the, uh, the outgrowing of community when you're on a, when you're on a hardcore path, oftentimes the community can't keep up with you. And especially if you're as powerful as he was, and it wasn't that he was faking it. He really was, he was so inventive and he really was like a lightning rod for ideas. And he was fearless in what he was willing to try. No, not all of it would yeah, I recommend. He was also, he was also really misogynistic. Yes, yes. Well, yes, there are problems yes. with Crowley, like many people of his era. And I say that yeah. not as an excuse to him because I, you know, we're in that world where we don't, we don't excuse it. We look at it and we go, this was commonly the way people were thinking. It is repugnant. We don't advocate for it. Um, not only was he a misogynist, he was somewhat of a bigot. So we know this about him. Um, it's not good. Peter Gray wrote a book called The Red Goddess, which is uh, in part about, well, it's entirely about Crowley's um, search for the goddess and he and Jack Parsons search for the goddess, goddess together for, the, for Babylon. And the thing that, that strikes me over and over again in that book, which, by the way, the book is half absolutely fucking brilliant. And the other half, I'm sitting there screaming, stupid fucking man, how could you not miss this? How could you miss this? Right. So, you know, just be, be patient with the book if you're a woman. <laughs> anyway. Um, but the thing that strikes me is that all of these things that are being listed in the book are all of the uh, experiments and the, the, the magic that was done with the women to try and invoke the the goddess Babylon into these women. And all of the notes are Crowley's and Parsons. None of them are from the women who held the enter the entities, the energies of the goddess. And I'm like, hello, McFly. What the fuck? Right? Yeah. So, but this is this is the time. This is the time. Right? And also as yeah. Crowley being Crowley as a writer, he listened to at the final you know, the final writings, it was all like it came through him. It was, or it didn't come at all. So right. while he took the channeling of what he did exceedingly seriously, and some of his most important works are channeled works, most notably book four, uh, called, you know, it's called Libra four. Uh, it is channeled in the Egyptian pyramids. It is one of his most important books. It is also considered, uh, one of the most profound texts in ceremonial magic. Um, so he did do a lot of channeling. He did go and really avail himself, open himself to being a clear and open channel for spirit to come through. And again, you know, this was in the early 1900s. I think if I'm remembering correctly, 1904 is the book of the law, which, you know, from which the very famous saying comes and where he goes to Cairo, uh, also as a charlatan on a certain level, claiming to be a royalty so he could live where he wanted to live and invoking the Egyptian deities and uh, studying Islamic mysticism. He studied broadly. I mean, this is the other thing about him. He was not a dilettante. He studied deeply. Um, he thought it was super important to know what he was doing and to speak with authority. Reminds me of you. A little, maybe. It was you sure you weren't him in a past <laughs> life? More than, one pe more than one person has said that to me. What's funny is that his funeral actually was on uh, a significant day for me. So uh, anyway, it's a whole other <laughs> joke for another time. I'm just saying. Yeah, other people have said it too. Um, so, but, but to, just to, to really give you a sense of it, he also was just a, a, a real seeker profoundly. And he, he traveled all around the world seeking wisdom and going to sacred sites so that he could really receive the wisdom where it supposedly was happening. Um, he also had real problems, you know, he was doing experiments much like we see people doing experiments with plant medicines and drugs and getting to altered states. And this ended up later becoming a real problem for him. And in fact, he died a drug addict, you know, he was using heroin. He had, you know, really 
and he wrote a fabulous book called you know, Diary of a Drug Fiend. I mean, so many of his books are incredible. Book of Lies is also incredible. There's many, many I would recommend. And if you want, I can send you a list of books to add to the podcast that I think are not to be missed. I mean, he wrote extensively. He wrote so many things. It's, it's hard to read all of it. And it takes time also because the language is the Victorian language. And plus Crowley hid things in text that initiates would understand that the lay person might not. And so there's that to overcome as well. But once you get the rhythm and real sense of how he writes, I love reading his writing, quite frankly. And so I, I recommend it for serious um, ceremonialists or people who really want to do a deep dive into the development of Western magic in the Victorian era, where it was really flowering, just amazing. The practitioners that came through the Golden Dawn, especially, it was no kidding, a hotbed of genius. It was like the Renaissance for magic. Definitely. You know, and Crowley himself also founded several orders, um, some of which are still in operation today, you know, and was a part of, um, many people are familiar with what's called the OTO, which was one of the very important orders, um, as well as his work with, um, and, and that just for people who don't know is Ordo Templi Orientalis, Orientis. Um, and um, that's also around the time of his connecting with this, he published the Book of Lies, which is an amazing book about mysticism. Uh, many people have called this uh, a pretty a hybrid work because it also includes his poetry, his magical work, and just scholarly notes that he took. And it's a, it's a big, huge book um that's that's worth your time that's worth reading and then you know he spends some time really living hand to mouth later in his life like uh where things are going poorly for him because he has upset so many people that he becomes uh notorious and unwanted persona non grata where he is his yeah. yeah where his acting out really finally came back and bit him in a bad way um, unfortunately. Um, and yet still there were many people who just held on to his every word. He was again, one of these people where you got into his presence and you were like either spellbound or appalled or both, where he had so much charisma and also so much ego that he could not stop himself from sometimes just going way overboard. And yet when you look at the body of what, of the work that he left us, his genius is just undeniable. And sometimes the problem being a genius is that you can't get out of your own way. Yeah. And connecting it, that, unfortunately, connecting it to the real world can often be challenging. too. So there's, there's a fair amount of your own work that you have to do in order to be able to access some of it because, you know, he wasn't grounded anymore because, you know, he was up in his own ego. The most impactful people are often also the most cracked people. <laughs> um, they, they are both the most brilliant and the most horrifying <laughs> um, at the same time in their own ways. And, and there is, a, there is a, a balance to be had with that. You, know? there, you have to recognize that, that no one is perfect and that in order to take in the wisdom that's being offered to you, you have to take the good with the bad and you have to be able to, to filter out the wheat from the chaff, right? And you can't be standing in judgment and saying, oh, well, you know, he was a drug addict or, oh, well, you know, he was persona non grata. And so therefore, you know, nothing he said is useful. It's not true, you know, and, and you also can't do the opposite, which is, oh, my God, he was so brilliant and he must have been an amazing person. Well, no, he was a flawed human just like everybody else. And and one of the real definitions of maturity is being able to look at a person and say they're a human they're not all good or all bad. They are a mix, just like all humans are. And I'm not going to judge them positively or negatively as all one or the other, right? And so that's part of the challenge that we face as we step into a more evolved state of being as well as a more uh, magical state of mind is being able to be with all that is. 
Yes. And I mean, I feel like an important thing for me to put in out there and it's a controversial thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I feel like in the world we live in it, yeah, there are many of them, but this is one that I feel is important, especially in the world we live in right now, which is to say that Crowley was a bisexual. Some of his sex magic work that got really suppressed is the stuff where he's like, men, women, everybody, <laughs> everyone into the pool. Um, he, and this actually, for me also put him both ahead of his time because he embraced that. And in fact, one of his most famous and infamous poems is a love poem to another young man. And it is a really not, you know, if by our current standards, it's hard to read for many reasons. It's also like, wow, that is an overshare. That is way too much. I do not. <laughs> um, at the same time, like really looking at who he was in that era, that it was it was a real thing for him to be like, nope, I embrace all of this. I will go to all of this. And even though later in life, he really sees himself as a straight man. And I think in many ways he was a conflicted human. And I think it's fair to say that um, because most of his famous work was his work with women right. um, and trying to, as you were saying earlier, you know, bring in goddess Babylon or the red goddess and the red woman. And there was a whole bunch of stuff that he was doing with women that superseded all the other work later, particularly with sex magic. But to to deny the wholeness of his being is also unfair. And that to really look at him and say he was experimental and open to so many things. And this is part of who he was. Yeah. You know, and uh, he was also like uh, regularly um, compared to and um held up against, you know, as, as a reason to, to denounce him was this too, for some people like, oh, you know, this man is a pervert, pervert, a pervert and, right. and all these other things. And while you could say that for certain other reasons to make that about his bisexuality to me is the same reason we wouldn't do that in current times. It is not a thing to say. It is not true. It is just different. And the modern culture in that era, if we think now is buttoned down, you know, the Victorian era is, and we can think of the fate of Oscar Wilde, you know, who was living in the same era and really struggling with a culture that really wanted to punish him for who he was. Right. And Same thing that's probably. not to say that we don't have that culture in today's world too. Oh, I mean, of course, it's, it, you know, you and I are lucky enough to live in, in rather liberal uh, mm -hmm. markets, but uh, that's my dog whining in the background for dinner. <laughs> um, we're, we're very lucky to live in rather liberal spaces, but there are places still in, in the U S and around the world that are very buttoned down still. And, um, but, you know, I also think about, you know, you said the the poem was quite overt and, um, you know, and, and then I think about, uh, 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 what is it, I'm trying to think, Hoosier, take me to church, right? That's, yes. That's pretty overt, right? Indeed it is. <laughs> and that was on, pri that was on, uh, you know, uh, I, I heard that song for the first time on Ellen, right? So it's like, you know, it, it's it's really sort of mainstream available. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Right. You know, it's that 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 all or nothing sort of dynamic that that comes out of places where you feel like you need to to judge others. And especially in today's world, you know, we really have to watch that. Yeah, I think that's important to say. And, and again, it, it brings us back around to the other thing, which is many people in the modern world reject Crowley. I feel like a renaissance of understanding is due yeah. regarding the work that he did and um, a reevaluation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a reevaluation um, of the importance of what he did, because a lot of it really was groundbreaking. And a lot of it is still in various forms hybridized in use today by many people and they have no idea. We wouldn't have so much of this Kabbalistic work that we see in many people's modern work had we not had Crowley and 777 to really break it down and give us all these associations and give us all these workings. And he did hundreds and yeah. they can be found in his books. Well, and I kind of, th I kind of feel like he, he is kind of standing in the same place as the difference between Lucifer and Satan. 
Satan being the prince of lies and, you know, um, the, the evil one trying to turn everyone to darkness and Lucifer being the light bringer who wants to be self-determinant, right? And, and you know, the two sides of the same coin, right? Um, and, and Crowley in many ways is the same way. Yeah. And for a while, he even had the moniker. He was known as the wickedest man alive for a while. And he both re relished it. And then at some point, it's like, you know, it was a big eye roll. But I think for the most part, he kind of loved the notoriety of being the wickedest man alive. Well, especially since he was a, you know, contemporary to Oscar Wilde, who was really competing for that. <laughs> so, well, yeah, yeah, very different, very, very different intention there too, of course. Whereas poor Oscar Wilde, that's a whole, yeah, it's a whole nother subject about someone else who I really admire deeply, whose work I love. If you're involved in ceremonial magic at any level, you know, if you're doing Gardnerian Wicca, if you're doing Hermetic Wicca, if you know, Hermetic, Hermetic uh, magic, if you're doing any type of ceremonial magician work, uh, you really need to give props where props are due to the man who really did, um, you know, codify that and, and create a lot of the structure for it. Um, uh, or at least, you know, translate a lot of the structure for it. If, if he didn't create it, he, he, he modernized it and brought it into regular use, um, within, within the spiritual world during his era. And mm -hmm. so, the golden you know, dawn certainly still yeah. too, I would say, you know, the golden dawn is, is incredibly important to know about and understand. And then from there springs Crowley who evolved so many of the things and also really took so many of them in a whole other direction. Yes. And so, you know, just to, to acknowledge and to, to educate yourself on the places where the workings that you're doing came from, right? Because, you know, how, how do you know what you're doing if you don't know the foundation of it? It's kind of like, like the, uh, the parents putting their five-year-olds into Maypole cer ceremonies, not realizing that they've got their five-year-olds doing a fertility rite, right? It's like, okay, yeah, you kind of should know what it is that, that, where this comes from, because then it would make sense to you that this was probably not appropriate. Uh, but, you know, these are the these are the things that we don't know because we don't look at the foundations of things. And as foundations are breaking down right now, which in the U.S. is very significant, um, as foundations are breaking down, the foundations become more important. The, the understanding of what those are becomes more important so that we know what these structures were built on so that we know how to modify them, how to hold on to what's important and how to let go of what it, what needs to change. And so in this era, that's really crucially important, whether it's in magic or anything else. Uh, we, as, as always, we talk about change in this podcast. And, um, you know, if you are on a spiritual path yourself and you are looking for some support or you're looking for the express train um you know the inner peace 101 program and the spiritual or the uh, sacred power and purpose mystery school are a great way to both activate what you've got going on and explain what's going on inside of yourself as well as to accelerate your process and allow you to get further faster so that you can uh, step into your purpose uh, and more efficiently as you go through your life. So uh, by all means, if that's something that's important to you, there is a link in the show notes to check out the Sacred Power and Purpose Mystery School and set up an appointment uh, to apply and see what that's all about. So and if you're curious about it, it's on my website under the Work With Me tab. So I want to thank you for being here, Charlemagne. We're, we're at the end of our time, but I'm going to ask you to do uh, the wrap-up thought for the day. Uh, one thought to leave our listeners with that is um, sort of a, a takeaway. So I would have to say that as a takeaway, particularly after talking about Crowley, which is to understand that genius comes in many forms and that the search for knowledge and the search for truth also takes many, many forms. And that it's it, the journey 
it's, and it's, it's in alliance with what you were just saying. The journey is so important in putting ourselves on the right path with the right people makes all the difference. Yeah. So I wish people a very beautiful and fulfilling journey in their magical learnings and development. Fantastic. And that's all we have for this week. So tune in next time when I share another episode on how to tap into energy, magic, and the spirit world. I'm Kelly Sparta here with Charlemagne Tremont, and you have been listening to Spirit Sherpa. So long, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Each mile I travel over 13,000 now. Spirit Trippa is the sole property of Kelly Sparta Enterprises and is distributed under a Creative Commons BY-NC-ND 4.0 license. For more information about this licensing, please go to www.creativecommons.org. Any requests for deviations to this licensing should be sent to kelly at kellysparta.com. To sign up for or get more information on the programs, offerings, and services referenced in this episode, please go to www.kellysparta.com. This episode of Spirit Sherpa has been produced by Honu Voice Productions with post production by Christopher Wright. Into my home and my